Well, I came to year-end climate talks here in Marrakesh with a clear plan to cover the most complicated elements of these talks and break them down for a general audience. I'd intended to focus mostly on how global supply chains would change in response to this process, and I still will, but Donald Trump's victory in the U.S. presidential election has changed everything. The talks themselves are continuing, and the Paris Agreement remains in place with or without the United States. But the backroom diplomacy that the Obama administration had proven so adept at, the unofficial talks inside the talks that lay the foundation for the next round, which was credited with getting the treaty implemented so early, that's gone. And I'll cover that in more detail in a later piece. In the first hours after Trump's victory, I spoke to some veterans of this process and found something resembling a consensus, namely that individual U.S. states and the corporate sector can step up to at least partially fill the void in climate competency. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know its ugly face. We should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth. We broke it, we own it. And nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields, and not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet, or is nature itself the answer? That's the question we ask in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And this week and next, we're coming to you from the Marrakesh Climate Talks, where we'll be posting a series of shorter pieces rather than long, involved episodes that I've been trying to create. Today, I'm bringing you very early reactions to Trump's victory. The first people I spoke to were Kevin Fay, who now heads the International Climate Change Partnership, or ICCP, and Dirk Forrester, who runs the International Emissions Trading Association, or IETA. They presented their views at around 11 a.m. Marrakesh time yesterday. That's 5 a.m. D.C. And I wrote them up in a story on Ecosystem Marketplace called Can Individual U.S. States, the Private Sector, and the International Community Fix the Climate Despite Trump Election? which you can find online at ecosystemmarketplace.com forward slash articles forward slash Trump hyphen reactions. Unfortunately, the sound quality was horrible, so they're not included in this podcast. But over the course of the day, I did catch up to other participants, including some former negotiators, and built on the prognosis offered by Fay and Forrester. You'll hear me referencing their prognosis throughout these little chats, which are kind of raw, I'm not editing or contextualizing, because there just isn't time for that. None of the actual negotiators I was able to corral would speculate on or off the record. Most people had their game faces on, trying to hope against hope that President Trump would respond to the weight of his office by becoming more responsible than candidate Trump behaved during the campaign. I personally feel that we're witnessing something like the five phases of Trump where the first phase is denial or wishful thinking. Speaking of denial, it was only after I conducted my interviews that we learned that Trump has put climate science denier Myron Abel of the Conservative Competitive Enterprise Institute in charge of his environmental transition team, or that he's considering Sarah Palin for the post of Secretary of the Interior, which covers fish and wildlife and and pretty much all federal lands. Still, the speculation that people engaged in was thoughtful and quite profound. These are solid professionals who've built their careers delivering incredible results under very difficult circumstances. The first is Mike Korczynski, who runs Wildlife Works, which develops and manages Red Plus projects. Red stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation, and you can learn more about it by listening to Episodes 2, 6, and 7. I ran into him at lunch and asked him what he thought the election means for the climate talks. Well, I, I think, to be honest, I don't know what it means. I think none of us do. I mean, we, we've, we've heard the rhetoric. You know, the, the, the climate change is a hoax perpetrated on us by the Chinese. So we've all heard that rhetoric. But we all heard a lot of crazy rhetoric during the campaign that, that uh, in all likelihood won't result in, in action in the light of a new day when, when the responsibility of running a country falls squarely on the shoulders of, of Mr. Trump. So I think, 
uh, time will tell. Um, I think clearly the risk is in the fragility of the Paris Agreement participation. The Paris Agreement itself is ratified and will survive this uh, political change, but whether the U.S. will continue to participate in the Paris Agreement is now clearly the, a question of the day for people at this conference. Um, yeah, one of the things that people have tried latching onto for some kind of sense of optimism is just hoping that Trump hasn't read the Paris Agreement, doesn't understand it, and when he finally understands that it's flexible, he might not bow out, he just might lower the INDCs. I mean, do you care to comment on that, or is that too much uh, getting into the head of someone who's head you don't want to be in? Yeah, yeah probably the latter, but um, yeah, I, look, um, I, I do think that, uh, well, I read his, his acceptance speech last night, I wasn't awake to see him, uh, but I read it, and, and, he, and he's already um, being more conciliatory in tone on a, on a wide range of fronts, uh, as you might have hoped from the horrible rhetoric that that uh, was the campaign, but so I, you know, I, I I don't think anybody really knows his own personal position on this subject necessarily, um, and I think when he gets into office, like any president, but probably more than any president ever, he'll be reliant on experts in his own party and hopefully elsewhere to understand what it means and understand why whether or not the US should participate and at what level and what changes to make and 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 you know I'm a I'm a believer in in sanity prevailing mm -hmm. ultimately in as we move forward here in society and so I think my optimism is intact mm -hmm. uh, if only because there have been so many hurdles to overcome for us to get to this point this, this is just the latest in a long line yeah. and it's an imagined hurdle at this point so let's wait till it's a real hurdle and then We'll figure out how to overcome it for the greater good. Another thing that uh, Dirk and uh, and uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Fay were both were both saying, well, now it's time for the states to step up. You know, California, New York, maybe other states will come along. Even some red states who have maybe a little more of an environmental leaning. Is that is that uh, just wishful thinking, or do you think there's something to it? You know, I think it's too soon to tell. I mean, I think I think. Um, you know, short of the West Coast seceding from the Union, which is not, which is an unlikely outcome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's changed the commitment in California or in in New York or in Oregon or Washington. I guess there's two two possibilities or three possibilities. Dire, right? Meaning, but I think that what, what is he, what is he really opposed to? He's opposed to big government, right? That's clear. And and the Republican Party, if they if they had a um, if they had a platform of any sort that you could poke a stick at. It was the opposition to big government at all levels, national, local, regional. And, and, and as a result, they were able to hold on to, to Congress and, and the Senate because that's obviously a very popular message right now with the American, with a lot of American people. So, so that could mean a number of things. It could mean that all the activity goes private. It could mean that, they're, they're, that instead of trying to implement this, these programs through large national programs pushed through central government, that it gets pushed out into the into the private sector, into the marketplace, essentially to figure out. And I do think, I do feel that there are, there has been a lot of growing awareness within the American corporate landscape as to the importance of climate change. And the fact that there's a new president who's not going to hammer them isn't going to change their commitment um, because most of that commitment has been um, rational and, uh, and and not ideological. So I think that there's one scenario that says the action goes to the private sector in the U.S., not everywhere else, of course. We're just talking about the rest of the U.S. Another scenario is it goes to the states, as you pointed out. And then the third scenario is it, it gets clobbered uh, and, uh, and discouraged, in which case all the innovation that is happening in the U.S. in climate will, will find a place to employ itself elsewhere, I think. Um, and because climate mitigation innovation is a, a, a mandatory requirement for the planet so it'll happen somewhere if it's not captured in the United States by the United States economy it'll be captured in Europe or or uh, Southeast Asia or in, in Canada so yeah, that's actually also that was the, the other the other thing that uh, Derek and Kevin were saying was that uh, the now the private sector really has to step up as well states will step up private sector really has to become aggressive and that they've actually turned on that they're not fighting it anymore they're pushing for it and that's but that's still I mean it's still it, we still have this issue with uh, high you know the high results low disclosure 
uh, problem that we have on supply chains, where we have every company that's reporting results is great, but most of them don't. Right. Well, I, I think, let's start with, with the, the positive trend there. Um, you're you're going you're gonna to have clearly two paths in the corporate world, right? The path that won't do anything until they're required to do it. And clearly they, they just got to get out of jail free pass at the federal level for the next four years, right? Then you've got the group that was doing it because they have they finally realized it's in the best interest of their business to do it. And that's most of the supply chain folks who legitimately acknowledge the that the consumer sentiment, if you want to say, and the market sentiment is you better be a good citizen regarding climate. So those, I think that activity will continue, I hope, and I think that activity will, will, um, will have to move beyond um, rhetoric and become much more transparent and, uh, and have much more integrity in reporting and, and, uh, uh, and then I think, but I, and I think that's important because ultimately, again, those companies them aren't doing it now. They're not moving because they think it looks like the right thing to do. They're moving because they think it is necessary for the future success of their business. And therefore, if they're reporting nonsense, they're hurting their business. And so I think that you take that logic through, they're going to want to fix that. And they're going to want to have a system that they can rely on that says that the results they're reporting are true and accurate and represent things. In the case of deforestation, if you look at that, the zero deforestation pledges, firstly, some, you have to figure out what is the scope of that pledge? What does zero deforestation mean? Clearly, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and have Indonesia be a zero deforestation landscape. So what is the timeline on a zero deforestation pledge from somebody who's getting supply from Indonesia? And what's the allowed progress towards that timeline that will allow them to keep making that pledge without getting hammered by the world, uh, but be honest about it with the world? And so not set an unrealistic expectation that deforestation is going to be zero tomorrow. Um, so I think that that indication is already a, a, a huge leap from where we were three years ago, where, and I think that leap is driven again by their recognition finally that, that it's not just about image necessarily or reputational risk, although that's a big piece. It's now about stability of supply and integrity of supply and are they going to actually be able to get what they need to be in business in the future. And so that means they want to be real about the performance. After Korczynski, I ran into Peter Graham, a former negotiator for the Canadian government, now working as a consultant in Washington, D.C. By this point, I had gotten some rather hopeful responses and began by asking him if we weren't just grasping at straws. No, I mean, it, it is uh, logical at this point for some to grasp at straws, um, but there are some, some straws that have been there and they're, they're strong. Um, and so while the impact, um, say, we're here in, at a COP, um, the impact on a global level, international relations and all that, um, may be more questionable in terms of how that'll unfold and the implications uh, in, of U.S. participation in multilateral and bilateral even uh, processes is, is maybe a slight more uncertain. To your questions for state-level action, um, I do come at it with them like, look, what do we have in place now that either cannot be altered by a presidency um, or is unlikely to be altered because it has its own momentum um, and its own support, and its own basically uh, gas to keep it going. So California's action, the governor's clear, basically they've been working uh, and achieving their goals and their targets um, successfully while growing their economy. So don't expect that to change. And as you said, I agree with, with your point um, in terms of other states. The thing is not necessarily looking at climate policy, but looking at intelligent energy policy, infrastructure, um, uh, looking at, as we're seeing more, um, how do we manage um, climate change impacts, regardless of whether somebody believes they're not man-made or not because of climate change. They, many other states, many states uh, see and are actually experiencing the impacts and are having to put in measures to um, to address them and also if they're looking further ahead um, with perhaps some, some push from, from reinsurance and insurance agencies um, to put in step me place measures to, to mitigate or minimize the, the impact of future events. So for the state level, I agree. Um, uh, the degree to which the federal government um, under Obama administration um, was able to 
foster a, a sort of a mood of more collaboration, learn from your neighboring states who has found a way to make this work for business, um, a way to make this work for, for taxpayers. Um, that, I expect, will slow down a little bit. Some people will dig in their heels um, to be seen. On the private sector side, um, similar idea. I mean, there are companies now making money out of selling more efficient appliances, selling more efficient um, uh, materials with, with uh, lower carbon footprints. Um, all these things are part of a climate change plan. But again, if you remove the climate change plan, they've been seen to be good for business. Uh, and so I do see that going on now. Again, some of those were incubated with the help of public funds. And so hopefully we can still find that where necessary um, from whether state level or through, again, energy efficiency measures. Um, the federal government will have challenges of its own related to climate change. And so hopefully, again, changing the frame in which you design these programs to say, okay, this is energy efficiency, this is uh, risk reduction. Those might be you know, the, the new way to, to do business with business um, in that political environment. And I guess now, now turning to where I think your, your area, your expertise is, the international negotiations, what kind of a hole is this, if it, assuming the worst, assuming he I mean, managed to pull out of... Uh, pull out of the Paris Agreement. I mean, technically, they have to give four years notice, he, but he can just do that unilaterally. Do you think that's realistic? And if they do, what, what kind of a hole does this leave? Uh, um, it would be significant. Um, I, at this point, would caution about assuming too much about the U.S. under the a new administration in terms of how they are going to engage or disengage in, in processes like this. Um, for them, it for the U.S. government under Trump, it will be less important, but it is, if it keeps going, which it will, um, with all the other actors, um, it is in effect a bit of a trade agreement, right? It affects trade of goods and the value of, of, of goods and trade. Um, and in that sense, if you follow some of the statements, the speeches um, of, the, of Trump and his administration, his new administration, as it will be, um, there is a sign that they were saying that they could make better deals than previously. So to me, that's a sign that maybe they'll give a go at trying to stay in to make it work better from their point of view uh, for the American people. Um, so I'm again back to, yeah, I would hesitate assuming that pulling out is going to be the first step. Maybe it is, it's hard to say, but they may see reason and say, okay, look, you know, we can do good for ourselves um, by staying in. And there was something that uh, Dirk Forrester said which is that, I mean, he assumes that uh, Trump hasn't read the Paris Agreement and doesn't know anything about it and doesn't realize that it has all these flexibility mechanisms. And he said maybe when he realizes that, he might just say, hey, it's in our interest to stay in, but we might reduce our ambition or just not raise it up. Does that, I mean, that's not good, but what if they do that? What kind of knock-on effect could that have on the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, there are... There are ways to minimize the cost of achieving your your targets. Um, uh, currently, the U.S. is planning to meet their target without the use of international offsets. If the new administration says, "Hey, so I hear we can stay in, you know, maintain our trade relationships that are important and whatever, um, but we can get cheaper offsets to help meet our target um, through you know, investing internationally." buying internationally, maybe they'll do that. That's certainly a possibility. Finally, there's Naomi Swickert, who works for the Verified Carbon Standard, which establishes rules for verifying and validating the amount of carbon captured in forests. Because so many people had mentioned the private sector, I began by asking her if this hope in the private sector seems viable. Keep in mind that because of her perspective, she focuses more on carbon offsetting than on the more general approaches that Peter Graham talked about. 
Yeah, I mean, to me, the challenge is that the private sector needs the rules under which to operate. And government plays a fundamental role in setting out, you know, what is the target? What are we doing to try to achieve it? And how, you know, how do we get there? And, you know, we had a challenge in the U.S. of making progress on that front. And Obama did what he could in terms of the clean power plan under the EPA, et cetera. But without that momentum and without the, the signal, uh, without the rules of the game, it's hard for the private sector to really make progress. They need to understand you know, where the risk is, how, the, how to assess it, how to, in, uh, you know, contribute to something which is achieving a goal set by government. So without that leadership, yeah, they can take a role, they can make progress to some extent, but it's going to be difficult for them to get nearly as far as we would without government leadership. Mm -hmm. um, can an organization like yours, how far can you go in providing those rules? And where, and where or, or, yeah. or another question, where does it stop? You know. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the VCS provides rules for carbon accounting, for how you actually develop projects and bring them to market. But the question is, where's the market? Where's the demand mm -hmm. come from? So a demand signal typically comes from a government saying, we're trying to achieve X target, and you can use offsets to get there. So without that demand signal, everything that we do in terms of saying, you know, here's the rules of the game for how you actually create an offset or how you work on environmental sustainability and agriculture it, it is difficult to move forward without having a, a segment of demand to drive right, it. Right, okay. It's tough. I mean, we just don't know anything yeah. about what yeah. we don't know anything about what he wants to do. Yeah. Um, you know, Trump never said a word about real policy related to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I think we did hear is that he wanted to undo uh, the rules or the clean power plan under, under the EPA. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully he moves away from that, but I think we just don't know. Um, you know, I think he is sensitive to business. So mm -hmm. uh, on the positive side, if he gets a strong signal from business that that's what they want, then perhaps maybe if I'm being optimistic. Yeah, yeah. Another one um, that people brought up is maybe states will start moving more aggressively forward. Even some of the red states, uh, you know, a lot of what, what they were pushing back against wasn't so much environment as, you know, you guys, you don't tell us what to do. Um, again, is that, does that sound like wishful thinking or does it, do you think there's any reason to believe that states beyond the ones that already have cap and trade might actually start to go in that direction or do something on it? Yeah, U.S. states can definitely set targets. I think, you know, that, that government at a state level does have an opportunity here to step up. And because they are government who can set programs, who can incentivize domestic markets like we've seen in California, mm -hmm. there is there is an opportunity there. But California has struggled to move that program, the, uh, the the program forward, particularly in terms of bringing in, you know, international red or other activities. And so, you know, the challenges are still there. And it, it's still, I think, important to have signals from national governments. And, you know, the states, the U.S. is probably unique in its ability really to do that and drive that at a state level compared to a lot of other countries. I've got to run now, but keep checking your feed for more updates from Marrakesh.